There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Let's lift our voices and praise our Savior this morning. Jesus' parents traveled to Jerusalem for a festival. When Jesus was 12, come on, they went just like every other year. But when the festival was over and Mary and Joseph were traveling back home, Jesus, Jesus, do you know? Nope. They realized that Jesus was not with them. Uh oh. Come on! So they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. This oh, his name is Jesus. I haven't seen him! They searched everywhere. Jesus! Not Jesus. Jesus! Jesus! After three days, they found him in the temple. Jesus was sitting among the religious teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Hey, Mom. When Mary and Joseph found him, they said, Why have you done this? We've been searching for you everywhere. But Jesus said, Why did you look for me? Didn't you know I would be here in my father's house? Uh. 
But his parents didn't understand what he meant. So Jesus left with them, See you later! Bye, Jesus! And came back to Nazareth, where he obeyed them. Hey! Here you go! And he continued to grow in wisdom and favor with God and man. Welcome to our family service at New Life. You just saw a sneak peek of what the children will be learning in their classes this morning. We have a wonderful children's ministry department with classes from nursery all the way through the sixth grade. Our teachers are excited to help your child grow in their foundation of faith. Out of respect for everyone around you, for any children that become restless in the service, we have a mommy in the room. This is a place where your child can play and enjoy a snack while you join us in worship through the monitor. Thank you for joining us this morning. Kids grades one through six can go meet with your teachers at this time. All right, as the children are dismissed at this time, we want to say welcome to New Life. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. We're so glad that for those of you who are joining us in person and those who are joining us online, we're so glad that you're worshiping today here with us at New Life. If it's been a while since you've been with us, or maybe this is your first time, we want to ask you, um, as you leave today, just stop by the Welcome Center. Just say, let us know, hey, we're relatively new, or it's been a while since we've been here. We want to bless you with this nice coffee mug from New Life. It fits, it's 16 ounces, but it only fit 15. Trust me, it'll spill over. Not a good thing, okay? But it'll help you think warm thoughts about New Life, all right, tomorrow morning on this cold February day, all right, but we want to uh, just bless you with this gift, and um, for those of you who are joining us today in the Next Step Seminar, we're so glad that you're doing so. When you leave the auditorium, you can go straight down the main hallway. It'll run right into our cafe, and uh, we're going to have lunch in there, and maybe you didn't get signed up for the Next Step Seminar, and you want to know more about New Life and even take a step in uh, making New Life your church home. We want to invite you, you, even if you didn't register, just stop by the Welcome Center and say, hey, can you plug Uh, me in or plug me and my spouse in or just let us jump in. Can we do that today? And we'll try to make that happen for you. All right. Now, for those of you who have been anticipating this, one week from tomorrow, one week from tomorrow is our group's launch, our next session of community groups. So make sure you're in a community group. All right. Many of you may attend the Seniors Adult Bible Study. That's wonderful. They meet on Tuesday nights out here in person. You can also join them via Zoom. But if you don't belong to that, we want you to belong to something, all right? So if you can, participate in a a community group. It'll be a great way for you to be cared for, and then also for you to help care for others in the flock of God here at New Life Church. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you through singing praise to you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to hear from you through your word, and Lord, to worship you with our tithes and our offerings. Lord, I pray for each and every individual here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would minister to our hearts in truly a unique way. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to sing today? And there's not a place 
But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Give God the praise this morning, shall you? You may be seated as we go to the Lord in prayer. In just a few minutes, you're going to hear a powerful message from Pastor Michael on Christ, the light of the world. And you know, he also instructs us that we are to be a sort of a reflection of his light, to let his light shine so that people would see our good works and glorify God. You might feel like, what can one person, how can that one individual make a difference? One light in a dark room can light the whole room. One Christian demonstrating the light of the love of Jesus Christ in a dark world that needs Jesus can have a tremendous impact. You matter to God and what you do matters to this world. We want to thank you for your donations. You can give one of three ways. You can give at the offering receptacles as you enter or leave the building. You can uh, go online, nlpositivefaith.com and give online. By the way, in uh, this past year, 2021, uh, approximately 40% of our offerings came online. So we want to say thank you to those that join us online, to those that give online, and God has really richly blessed that particular aspect of our ministry. Or you can mail it to New Life Church, P.O. Box 228, uh, Osceola, Indiana, 46561. Let's go to the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We thank you for the good news of the glorious gospel. Anoint Pastor Michael as he preaches your word. God, encourage each and every one. Thank you for the band, the tech, all aspects of the service. May Christ be encouraged for the children's ministry and all of the teachers there. God, just have your richest blessing. And then as we leave this place, God, may we go out with a song in our heart, a spring in our step, and a fresh desire to be a light in a dark world for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For anyone battered, for any heart shattered, anyone sinking down, hold on, hold on. For all of the sinners, for the weary and weathered, thrown and tossed, hope is lost, hold on, hold on. There is an anchor in the rage of the storm When the walls are closing in In the darkness all alone Just praying for the daylight Peace for the soul There is grace for the morning When you feel like letting go there is an anchor There is an anchor To all who have faltered There is an altar Bring your plea on bended knee Bow down, bow down all you sons and daughters, run to the Father. You're not too far from open arms. Come home, come home. There is an anchor in the rage of the storm. When the walls are closing in, in the darkness all alone, just praying for the day.
is the anchor for my soul. Christ is the anchor. Oh, He is the anchor. Amen. He is the anchor. Let's go to the anchor this morning, shall we? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life on this earth, his sacrificial death, the resurrection, Lord, that we claim and we hold on to. Lord, teach us from your word today. Speak to each and every heart, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about light. And Jesus claims to be the light of the world, right? So when you think about light, what comes to your mind? Well, I think about that movie, Castaway, which was, you know, back in the 90s, a good movie, somewhat terrifying and somewhat, you know, entertaining at the same time. Terrifying because the thought that it actually could happen. Now, we know that it wasn't real, it wasn't based on a true story, but the thought it could happen. A guy could be stranded out there on an island all by himself and no help, and he has to find his way back and get back introduced to humanity again. How do you do that? Well, it was played by a character, Tom, Tom Hanks, and if you remember the movie at all, there was a period, like on that first night, you know, he was just terrified, all the sounds of the island, and, you know, he couldn't see anything, and it was just the light of the moon, and that was about it, and so he had to figure out how to make light. He had to figure out how to make fire, right, because he needed light, he needed heat to survive, and he needed to be able to, you know, something to cook with would be kind of nice as well, right? So he finally gets it started, and I have a picture of the moment when he gets the fire going, that, that moment. Ah, there it is. Look at him. He's so excited. Why is he so excited? He's so excited because he didn't have it, and we don't really know what we have until it's gone, right? And he didn't have light. He didn't have heat. He didn't have any way to cook. And so like now he has fire. And the whole mission for the next four years is to keep that fire burning, to keep it going. And if you remember at all the end, it's interesting that at the end of the movie, he gets on a makeshift raft. He gets out to sea. He's finally able to get out there and he gets rescued by a passenger uh, freighter that's coming by. And, and long story short, at the end, if it, it kind of captures him and he's like, in, he's in the bedroom and he's just like, He's hitting the light switch. Because for four years, he had to go through the labor of keeping the light. And he's so enraptured by the idea that he can just hit a light switch and turn the light on and off. And you see, when I think about what we're going to take a look at today, I think that humanity is a lot like this island. Humanity is just on this island. We're in this dark island. We are completely severed from God. We're on our own. We are lost, Scripture tells us. We are in darkness. We needed help. And when Jesus showed up, when Jesus came on the scene, and Jesus began to live His life and began to demonstrate who He was, we had hope. We had light. And so it's with that that we approach the Scripture today. Jesus is the light. What does this mean for me? How is Jesus being the light of the world? What does this mean for you and I? Not only if we don't know Christ, but those of us who do know Christ, what does this mean for us today? Well, we pick up today after the Feast of Tabernacles has kind of concluded, and people kind of, they headed off to their homes, and Jesus, He had gone all over to the, the Mount of Olives, and He had been there, and then He came early in the morning to the temple, and He began to teach again. And where he's teaching, the the place that he's teaching, the treasury, as I've shown you the social pyramid, not only was the social pyramid important for like different uh, aspects of Jewish life, but it also mattered in the temple. And so where people got to worship in the temple uh, did kind of depend on where they fell on the social pyramid. And where Jesus is teaching, there are a lot of women present. This is where a lot of the Jewish women were able to go and to worship and to be part of uh, the temple at that time. And so Jesus is in the temple, and he's teaching, and so there probably are a lot of women around him, and he is teaching uh, his truth of who he is, and what he, and, and the way he knows God the Father, and he's doing these different things, and the, the Pharisees, they decide they're going to launch an all-out attack on Jesus. And so it's with that that we come to the text this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John seven fifty three. It's just the last verse in, in John 7. Or you can go to John chapter 8 and just go back one verse, okay? However you want to get there, just get there, okay? So 
As you turn there in your Bibles, all right, I want to just show of hands. Does anybody have like that little thing up above in brackets? Does it say this was not part of the early manuscripts? Do you guys have that? Okay, all right. So raise your hands. You're reading the non-inspired version, okay? <laughs> no, I, I mean that as a joke. The, the new, uh, new International Version, I joke, is the non-inspired verse, but it's a good version. It's okay. You can keep reading it. All right, let me share with you what that means. All right, so there were a few sets of scrolls that go back further, okay? So when they began to translate the text, there were a few scrolls that went back further. They dated further back, but there were fewer of them. There was a majority of scrolls, a bunch of scrolls that they discovered, and they didn't go as far back, but there were more of them, just an abundance more of these scrolls. So if you have like the NIV version, they base their translation off the older scrolls that are fewer. If you have like the New King James version, they base them off of the majority of scrolls, which are more but newer scrolls. If you have the New, Inter New American Standard version, they have both. That it's, it's called the, the Bible Scholar's Bible because the, the, that actually brackets what's the old text and still keeps the new text. So you got just a little bit of Bible history today. No conservative Bible scholars argue the canonicity of this text. So if you're reading this and you're saying, well, is this even supposed to be in the Bible? Nobody would argue that. They just wonder about placement of where it would go. So please don't read those headings and say, well, we must not live up to this. No way. It's in your Bible. And that's how we approach it today. And I think you're going to see it fits right here. All right, let's go. You ready? Let's read. Would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's word? Let's get some exercise in today. All right. Chapter 7 and verse 53. And everyone went to his own house. Why did they go to their own house? Because the Feast of Tabernacles had just kind of concluded, so everybody went their way. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all of the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Now this they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. They didn't really care about what this woman had done. They just wanted to trap Jesus. They were sick of the teachings of Jesus. They wanted to get Jesus discredited. They wanted to get him just cast out. They were tired of the teachings of Jesus. They were tired of what the effect he was having on the common people. And so they wanted to put this in front of him to accuse Jesus. I find this very interesting. The same law that applied to adultery for a woman applied to a man. Why the man wasn't drugged in front of Jesus, we do not know. But for whatever reason, there should have been two of them drugged before Jesus, but there was only one. And think about where Jesus is teaching. Jesus is teaching in the court, which have, has a lot of women. They are actually trying to trap Jesus. They're trying to discredit him. They're trying to get him to say something wrong that will just destroy him. So what's Jesus do? Jesus stoops down. And he began to write on the ground with his finger as if he did not hear. I love that. Like You guys, you still don't get it. Just kind of having some fun doodling on the ground. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground again. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And I think it's interesting that that's included, beginning with the oldest. There is something that comes with age, a, a, a sense of maturity, a sense of understanding, a sense of self-evaluation. These men knew, beginning with the older, and this, this culture valued the elderly in a deep way, in their life experience, in their wisdom. One by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they left. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw that no one but the woman was there, he said to her, woman, which is not, you and I are reading this today in our you know, 2022 glasses. This is not intended to be, you know, rude or anything like that. This would be the same as you and I today in our culture saying, ma'am or miss? Ma'am? 
Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I. I, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This was a great example of the mercy of God. Not giving what someone does, does deserve. Jesus isn't saying this isn't a sin. He's telling her, go and sin no more. Then he spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees who were there in the midst of him, what did they say? You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. See, in this culture, it took two witnesses to provide uh, proof. So for them to bring this woman in front of Jesus, there were two witnesses. She was caught in sin. It was over for her. It was, she was guilty as charged. Two witnesses verified. They're saying to Jesus, we had two witnesses. You don't have two witnesses, two witnesses for yourself. Why do you keep saying who you are? All you are is testifying for yourself. Who's the other witness? Jesus says, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I came from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, just like with this woman. You judge just according by what you see. I judge no one. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Jesus says, I am one who bears witness of myself. There's one man. And the Father who sent me, God the Father, bears witness of me also. Then they said to him, where is your father? They knew who Jesus was talking about, but they're trying to pin him down. Jesus says, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. Jesus' hour had not, what hour? Where he would pay for the sins of humanity on the cross. You may be seated this morning. I know many of you are wondering if you were going to get to sit down. Man, you give Michael a text and he stands. Who, know, we are, who knows what's going to happen next? Well, when you think about Jesus being the light of the world and you think about the reality of the situation, the severity of the situation that Jesus was involved in and the woman being drugged before these people openly in this square and being accused of this, this is, so, this is so huge. And for Jesus to then, on the heels of dealing with these both of these parties in a truly masterful way, Jesus dealt with both in a masterful way. He dealt with the sin of the religious leaders, their arrogance, their pride, their self-seeking. He dealt with them in a truly masterful way. And he also dealt with the sin of this adulterous woman, which is a sin. And he, he clarifies that. Go and sin no more. He dealt with her in a truly masterful way. Then he follows up with, I am the light of the world. So what can we apply to our lives through this? I would encourage you to think about it like this. The darkness of the world hates the light of Jesus. The darkness of the world hates the light of Jesus. It's never more evident than what we see right here in this text. The darkness of the world hates the light of Jesus. I think it's interesting, this religious group, these religious leaders, they were angry at Jesus. They wanted to trap Jesus. Man, they wanted to discredit him. They wanted to destroy him. They wanted to get rid of his testimony. They wanted him out of their lives, out of their power scheme, out out forever. Get out, Jesus. So they found a woman caught in adultery. Again, we don't know where the man is, but obviously they left him alone, which is wrong in and of itself. But this is a tricky thing here because for Jesus to answer yes to the request for stoning, remember who Jesus is. Jesus was known as a, he was known with the common people. It says the common people heard Jesus gladly. On the social pyramid, those who were not at the top loved Jesus. Those who were at the top hated Jesus. For Jesus to answer yes, he would lose his rapport with the common people. Jesus would lose that connection. The people that heard him gladly would potentially not hear him anymore. 
But for Jesus to answer no, would to be to deny his own law that has been established in Deuteronomy. Jesus was put in a place that would seem like a no-win situation. Jesus didn't bend down on the ground and start drawing because he didn't know what to answer. Jesus knew what he was going to do. You see, they came at Jesus, which is interesting, these religious leaders, the very system that God had set up, the temple system, the priests, that God himself set this up in the Old Testament. It's interesting how Satan was able to go in to an organization, to something that God had established, and God saw it as good, and Satan was able to blind these people with darkness, and so the religious leaders who should have been representing the light were actually consumed in the darkness just like everyone else around them. It's actually fascinating. And I think that for Christians, we must understand that Satan is in the business of deceiving us. He's in the business of getting us in the dark, keeping us in the dark. That's his whole goal. And he can even use religion to sidetrack us. He did that with the religious leaders here. Satan hates light. He hates Jesus Christ. And the darkness of this world hates Jesus. They didn't want the light of Jesus. You see, these religious leaders were praying for and waiting for and hoping for the Messiah. The Messiah comes, and now they're saying, whoa, 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 we don't want you here. We don't want this. This isn't what we wanted. This isn't what we bargained for. We didn't think this was going to happen. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah. That's what's happening in this text. And Jesus deals with them. He deals with their heart. Their goal was to trap Jesus. They wanted to discredit him. Ultimately, they wanted to kill him. Now, I want you to think about something. If the world, which when we say the world, when Jesus talks about the world in the Bible, he means society without God. Society without God. So if the world, society without God, if the world will hate Jesus as the light, let me tell you something. The world will hate you and I as believers. Luke 640 says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but when he's perfectly trained, will be like his teacher. Now, you and I won't ever be Jesus. But if we become the light and we represent the light to others around us, those who love the darkness will hate the light. And so we must understand there will be people in our lives, Satan will use people in our lives to seek to discredit us, to seek to discourage us, to seek to destroy us. Satan will use our own self-pursuits to try to lure us into sin, James 1 tells us. He will use our peer pressure. He'll surround us with people that actually enjoy the darkness, and, it, and it'll pour on to us the encouragement to stay in the darkness. He'll use peer pressure. He will use persecution. Those who he puts around us, if we don't actually begin to partake in the darkness, they will begin to persecute us, make fun of us at best, destroy us at worst. He will move on to self-destruction. He'll try to destroy us from the inside out, the idea of bitterness taking root in our lives. And if all else fails, he will move on to actual destruction. And I think of the martyrs that have gone before us. And as American Christians, we don't often see the articles or read the news clips, but I will tell you, martyrdom is as big today in the world as it was back then. It's happening. We should pray for those who are facing their death because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Satan hates Jesus. Darkness hates light. Well, I'd encourage you to think about it like this, though. Even though darkness hates light, the light of Jesus Christ cannot be put out. It cannot be extinguished. It cannot happen. This was an all-out attempt to try to get Jesus to stop teaching, to discredit him, to get rid of him. Well, Jesus raises the bar. Jesus never lowers the bar. Do not misunderstand this, that Jesus was okay with the sin of this woman. That is not true in any way. In fact, what Jesus is doing, Jesus always raised the bar. Jesus, he goes beyond the idea of just physical sin. Jesus says what? Anyone who looks at a woman with lust in his eyes has committed the sin of adultery. He raises the bar of sin in life. And so when Jesus says, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first, this also could be literally translated, he who is without this kind of sin 
in his heart. Let him throw the stone first. And each of those men were convicted. Took a step back. Walked away. The light of Jesus Christ cannot be put out. When you and I walk in the light, the darkness may try to put us out, but Satan can never put out the light of Christ. What that means is, Satan may draw you into a sin, but if you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit in your life, and you're sensitive to that conviction, you come to the realization that it is sin and you repent of that sin and repentance is just a change of heart a change of mind and a change of direction okay i was walking this way and this is sin and i shouldn't do that and i've come to the understanding that it's sin and in my heart i'm going to repent and tell the lord lord i'm sorry for this sin and now i'm going to change i'm going to stop committing that sin so i'm actually walking in a different direction the light of jesus christ cannot be put out Satan might be able to launch an all-out attack to discredit you. He may be able to discredit you, but he can't discredit your Savior. He can't discredit your Lord. Satan may actually, as we've talked about martyrdom, he may actually be able to take our physical life from us. He may be able to do that. But he can never put out the light of Jesus Christ. It can't happen. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus doesn't say he's a light in this world, a way of living, a way of doing life a good way. Jesus actually claims to be the only way, the light. I am the way, the truth, the life, Jesus says in John 14. The light of the world. That is who Jesus is claiming to be. The only light, the only way. Jesus' light can never be put out you see you and i are part of something so much bigger we're part of so much something so much bigger than ourselves you and i are part of something that's so much bigger than this church you and i are part of something so much bigger than any denomination in this world you and i are part of something we call it the light of the world and while you and i you know what we may come and go on this earth you know life is but a vapor james tells us just here today and gone tomorrow but you know what the light of jesus christ endures forever you and I are part of this life, of this light. Jesus cannot be put out. I'd encourage you to write down, the light of Jesus is self-revealing. The light of Jesus Christ, it reveals itself. So he is equating himself in this time. If you think about it, he, he went early in the morning to the temple. So Jesus arose early in the morning and he went to the temple. And so what is happening early in the morning? Those of you who get up early, what do you see? You get to see the sun come up, right? Now, in Old Testament thought, there is a lot of tying of God to Son. Now, it's not in the idea of a Son God. Please do not misunderstand this idea here. But it's the idea that just like the Son, the, the world revolves around the Son, and the Son brings light to the world, just like that, God the Father, He is self-existent, and he, the, the world revolves around Him, and He brings light. Jesus is saying He's this kind of light. And He is saying that He, he is self revealing just like you and i when we see the sunlight we don't wonder i wonder if light is actually coming from the sun we just know jesus is saying when you see his teachings and you see the way he has lived his life and he's saying when you understand the truth of who he is and you begin to process that reality of jesus as the eternal son of god and you begin to see it what happens is it just begins to reveal man to your you just under, come to this understanding jesus is who he says he is he is self-revealing we don't need any other source although we have them we have the word of the living god jesus reveals himself and he says what does he say it is is not written in your law that it takes a testimony of two men i am one who bears witness of myself but there's also the father who bears witness of me Light is often associated with understanding, with wisdom, with discernment. We'll often say to someone who makes a good decision, wow, that was, a, that was an enlightened decision. On the flip side, darkness is always tied to 
you know, the idea of, uh, you know, a lack of wisdom, a lack of discernment. And oftentimes if someone makes a foolish decision, we say, whoa, who kept them in the what? Dark. Jesus is the enlightened way to live. Everyone's looking for a code to live by. And Jesus says, I am that code. If you live my way, you have life. Not just eternal life in heaven, you have life here. If you reject my way, you wander in darkness and it produces death. Jesus will reveal himself to you. He'll convict us of our sin. He does this in a truly masterful way. And then not only does he convict us of our sin, but he shows us our sin. And when, when he shows it to us and he convicts us of it and we repent of it, Jesus forgives us of our sin. And then he also will command us not to sin. Just like he did to this woman, he says he gives her mercy. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. What did he say to her? He said, go and sin no more. Jesus wasn't saying this wasn't a sin. He was just saying, now it's time to stop. Go and sin no more. And he'll help us sin no more in those areas. He'll help us navigate through uh, the sin that surrounds us, the darkness that surrounds us. He'll do so through the Word of God, through Scripture. He'll do so through the Holy Spirit that indwells the believer. He'll do so through the fellowship of believers that surround us. He'll do so through the teaching of your pastors. That's what Jesus does. He uses these instruments to reveal the light to you in your life and the direction to take. I'd encourage you to write down, the light of Jesus is the only guide that ultimately leads to life. The light of Jesus is the only guide that leads to life. These men were judging. They were judgmental. They were arrogant. Th these men were living in a way in this darkness that would ultimately lead to their death. You can't keep living the way these Pharisees are living, these, these priests and these Levites. You can't do that. These scribes, you can't keep living this way and it not take you down the path of death. This woman was also living in a way that would lead to death. Sin, full grown, produces death. All sin. Pride, Proverbs says, pride goes before destruction. That can be literal destruction in our lives. Our pride can destroy everything. It can destroy our careers. It can destroy our homes. It can destroy our children. Our pride can destroy so much. And ultimately, our own pride can take us down. It can destroy our own physical life. It can do that. Sinful groan produces death. But Jesus offers an alternative way of living. Jesus offers a way of living that if you believe in Him, you have eternal life. And if you apply, you follow Jesus, you experience a life of abundance here. He doesn't force it upon you. He gives you the chance to choose. Choose your path to live in light or to live in darkness. Think of some of the ways that God uses light in Scripture. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5 says, God is light. Ephesians 5, 8 through 14 says, wherever the light shines, it reveals man's wickedness. Psalm 119 says that the word of God is a lamp to his feet and a light unto our path. Jesus here is wrapping up in the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, just like last week, we talked about how Jesus turned, he said, I am that water, I'm that drink of living water. I want to share with you now, remember the Feast of Tabernacles, what did they do? They decorated the temple, they decorated, decorated that whole temple, just like you and I decorate for Christmas, and we put lights all over our houses and all that wonderful stuff. They decorate the temple, they put candelabras everywhere, candles all over the place. There were candles in every nook and cranny of the temple, and the temple was a massive, massive structure holding thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So there's lights everywhere. But what are these candles for? Well, just like that water, that pitcher that was dipped in the pool of Siloam and it was carried and a, the parade was used to represent the water that was drawn from the rock during the wilderness wanderings, those candles that were in the temple were very, they were very important. They were reflective on the way God led the people during the wilderness wanderings, during the time where they left Egypt. So if you go all the way back into the Exodus, when they exited out of Egypt, God led the people. 
Now, Moses didn't have a GPS. Moses didn't even have a map. Moses didn't know where he was going. So how was God going to lead the people? God led the people. I want to show you a picture here. God led the people through two ways. He led them through the pillar of cloud if it was daylight. But if it was night and it was dark and you couldn't see the pillar of cloud, God used the pillar of fire. And so what the people would do when they were exiting out of Egypt and they were going through the desert and they would wander through the desert until they got to the promised land. And the promised land is where these people are right now. They are, th this text we're reading, they're in the promised land, in the temple where God had promised to take them. The way that it would work is this pillar of, of cloud by day or fire by night would move. And when it would move, the people would pack up their tents gather all their belongings, get their livestock, they put it all together, and they would follow the cloud, or they'd follow the pillar of fire until it stopped. When it stopped, they would unpack camp for a little bit. They would enjoy that place. They would live life a little bit. When that pillar would move again, they'd pack everything up, and they'd get their kids, and they'd get their, they'd get their, their livestock and their goods, and they'd gather it together. They'd put their tent together, and they'd follow that pillar until ultimately one day they would be in the promised land. Now the people in Exodus, they didn't know when they would get to the promised land. They didn't know if they would even see the promise. They just trusted that by following God, God would fulfill his promise. Jesus is saying that I am the light of the world. And he's looking, he's showing these people in the temple, he is drawing their idea. You have just spent a week remembering the water that was used to nourish the people in the Exodus, you have remembered the pillar of fire that has led the people from the wilderness to the promised land. Where you now are, Jesus is saying, I am that fire. I am the one. I am the one that led the people all the way to where you are today. I am that light. That's who Jesus is saying. He says, you follow me, you will find your way through life. You choose not to follow me, you will wander in darkness. Following Jesus Christ is the only way that leads to more life. Ignoring Jesus, ignoring the pillar of fire, if you will, is the only way that leads to more death. We have a choice. What are we going to do? Who are we going to follow? Are we going to follow the light of the world? Or are we going to choose to live in darkness? When I think about darkness, I think about a family vacation we took a few years ago. We just put our son, Ethan, to bed, and I told the girls, I said, grab your flashlights. Let's go down to the beach to see if we can find some stuff. My younger brother used to find crabs. I th they used to cook them and stuff, and I was like, let's go see if we can find some. I wasn't going to cook any. I was just going to go find them. And I was like, let's go see what we find. So we get down to the beach, and it was crazy. I mean, like, you got the little crabs, and you got the crab crabs, and, like, they're just everywhere. If you shine your light, they just kind of, like, scatter. It's crazy. So if you go for a walk on the beach, just know you're walking in the dark who knows what you're stepping on so we're down there and the girls they're they're little and they're kind of shining their flashlights and we're trying to oh i found one dad i found one we're you know oh cool follow it follow it and this mob of people start approaching us and i'm like <whistles> like hey girls come here come here they're little kind of like pulling them close like making sure i have like them because <clears throat> there's a lot of people coming up to us and i said i said the phrase i said how can I help you? Which is slang for, what do you want with me? Why are you here? He said, you're not from this area, are you? He said, why do you ask? They said, well, you can be arrested right here, right now for using those flashlights on this beach. And you can be fined thousands of dollars. We are here to protect the sea turtles. And we are here to protect their birth, their natural habitat. You are not allowed by law to use those flashlights on this beach. He said, I am very sorry. <laughs> the building that we are staying in did not tell us any of this. That would have been information nice to know at check-in. So we will turn our flashlights off. He said, thank you. So they walked away. A little rattle. They're like, okay. That was better than I thought. I'm like looking around, like, who am I going to have to wrestle to get off the beach? You know what I mean? Like, this could get bad. Well, something else happened that night. 
as we're kind of walking and trying to find our way back to the building, which I have no idea. There's, all the buildings look the same when you're on the beach. And I'm like, okay, I can't use a flashlight. I don't even know where I am, you know. But as your eyes adjust, the light of the moon really is brighter than you think. And so I have a picture of this. It was, this is a lot brighter than what we saw. But when you think about the moon, and it got me thinking, two things about this account, two things. Number one, the moon does not actually have any light in and of itself. The surface of the moon reflects the light of the sun. And I thought about it. You know what? To wander in darkness is terrifying. Especially when you have a mob of people walking up and you can't see their faces. You don't know who you're talking to. You don't know what they're going to do. It's terrifying. So when Jesus says he's the light of the world, that's a beautiful statement because to walk in darkness is terrifying. And number two, as believers in Jesus Christ, we don't contain any light in us. We're like the moon. But what Jesus wants to do is he wants to reflect off of us into this dark world. And as Jesus reflects his light off of our lives into this dark world. Two things happen. Number one, those who are wandering in darkness find a way to Christ. They can find their path to see Jesus Christ because he's the light that we're reflecting. And number two, believers around us are comforted by the light that we provide in this dark world. And if you and I will use our lives together to be reflective like the moon, if you and I will use our lives together, not only will we reflect just one light, but we will be reflective and we will multiply the light of Christ in a powerful way in a truly dark world. People look around and they say, man, what is going on in our society today? What's happening in our society today is darkness is playing itself out. Jesus needs more reflection of himself he doesn't want us to hide from the world jesus wants us to go into the world and reflect the light of jesus christ to everyone around us let's go to the lord in prayer with every head bowed and every eye closed nobody looking around maybe you're here today and you don't know jesus christ is your savior maybe you're you're conflicted you're not really sure if you've affirmed what you believe about jesus in your life i'd like to give you that opportunity in the quietness of your own heart, just go to him in faith believing and say, Jesus, I believe in you as the eternal son of the living God, who you claim to be, the one who came and died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Come into my life and save me. Again, that's dear Jesus, I believe in you in who you say you are, the eternal son of the living God, who came and lived a sinless life and died on the cross in my place and rose from the dead for my sins. Come into my life and save me. I wonder, Christian friend, maybe you're here today. Have you lost sight of your purpose? Have you lost sight of where you are? Christ wants you to reflect Him in the world around you. Are you following the light of Christ? Are you applying it to your life? Ask the Lord to use you, to use you strategically right where you are in your life. Ask Him to use you to reflect Himself to the people around you. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you for this account. We thank you for this reality that Jesus is the light of the world. May we live our lives in light of this light. And Lord, may we be reflective of this light to everyone around us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we close in song?
Thank you for joining us for worship today. If you're participating in our Next Step Seminar and you have children with you, you can leave them in, your cl in their classes. They'll eat lunch in there with their leaders and then you can join us in the cafe. Again, you go out to the lobby, go left and go straight down the hallway. You'll run right into the cafe. And if you didn't sign up and you want to jump in last minute, just let us know. We'll squeeze you in. We're glad that you're worshiping with us today. Would you pray the benediction with me this morning? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for joining us today.